Welcome to episode 39 of the Serious About Security podcast for May 13th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson and Mike Hill, and possibly Josh Gillum, if he's able to get his Google Hangouts working. Um, and Keith will uh, summarize the first article. So this is an article about some ATM fraud. Um, <clears throat> what's different here is that this is massive ATM fraud in that thieves were able to steal approximately $45 million in just a couple of hours. Um, and they kind of did it through uh, having multiple people access ATMs all around several cities worldwide to conduct this fraud, which is very interesting. And so part of what they did involved um, compromising account details um, and then basically uh, using that information with bogus magnetic swipe cards to go and access ATMs and uh, basically withdraw a ton of cash. And this, um, you know, as it was described by the prosecutor in the case, uh, they called it a virtual criminal flash mob. Uh, basically, they used any old plastic card they could get, um, and as long as they had the right account data and access codes, they were able to go in and conduct more than 36,000 transactions worldwide and steal about $45 million. So <laughs> this is a pretty significant amount of, of uh, cash, obviously, stolen, and the way they did it was kind of interesting. Um, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about this today, and that you know that's really all I have to describe it at this point. There are a couple articles that we'll post in the notes. Um, some of some of these were kind of funny because some of the evidence uh, used in the prosecution of this, or will be used in the prosecution of this case, includes uh, photos of two of the defendants with a big pile of cash and them sitting in, in their car. Uh, so perhaps they were not the smartest folks uh, around in terms of you know hiding their, their moves, but um, this was very interesting. I believe this is the second, this, this $45 million was a second heist um, that they conducted an, a, an earlier one late last year um, kind of to test to see how well this worked, I guess. And so um, they have several photos uh, that they've gathered in evidence uh, showing what they've spent their money on or, um, you know, big piles of cash here and there from the, the actually going out and swiping all these uh, from these ATMs. So I thought this was kind of interesting. It's interesting from the fact that some of what they did uh, required getting account details. Another article I have posted it in, involves uh, talking about some Indian outsourcing firm that may have also been involved uh, in some of this uh, in terms of getting account details uh, that were needed to conduct this fraud. So anyways, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, it combines both uh, uh, access to account details that somebody shouldn't have had access to with a physical attack of actually going and capturing money from all these ATMs and to do it in kind of a coordinated fashion. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, amazing attack if you really think about how uh, coordin coordinated they needed to be uh, to pull that off. Um, one of the things I found interesting was not only did they obtain the debit card data, but it seems like they were able to, to then go into the systems and eliminate the withdrawal limits on those accounts. So they were able to uh, essentially kind of empty ATM machines as they went along. Um, and I believe in one of the articles you 
posted, it kind of shows the, the one guy's map of, I think it looks like about 10 stops. And, you know, you can see uh, just pulling as much money as you can from each ATM as he goes along the way. You know, 4000 here, 2000 there. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, um, as you already noted, was the pictures these guys are kind of caught up in. Uh, I believe you can kind of see over time that the backpack this guy's carrying is getting uh, a lot heavier as he goes from, from stop to stop. And um, I don't think, I, I kind of agree, I don't think they did a real good job, at least these two in these pictures did a good job of hiding what they were doing. You know, we have pictures of Rolexes and I believe, you know, Gucci boxes and a, and a Porsche. So that, that might raise some eyebrows if, you know, you're, you know, kind of uh, working at a, at a local restaurant and, you, and then you buy a Porsche or something like that. So uh, I'm not sure they did the best job of hiding their footsteps, at, but, you know, they were just a, a couple operatives in, in the whole thing. So uh, that was a pretty elaborate uh, scheme they pulled off here. Well, I, I think this also highlights um, maybe to the banks about how insecure magnetic strips are. I think uh, one of the articles I read just pointed out how any, you know, that you can, you don't need a, an ATM card. You just need something with a magnetic strip on it, including hotel key card. Um, I don't remember what else they were talking about. But anything with a magnetic strip is a magnetic strip, and it can be encoded to work in an, in an ATM. The only thing an ATM does is read the magnetic strip, and it's just some information coded on it. So there's really, uh, it's a pretty insecure um, uh, system, really. Um, that, you know, there was an experiment quite a while back with using the uh, smart smart cards um, but that never caught on for some for some reason I think it was mainly the cost of replacing all the equipment out there um, is you know there's a lot of ATMs out there as you can see with all the ATMs that were that were uh, that were robbed so um, the cost of replacing all of those to accept something other other than a magnetic strip is that is that cost prohibitive uh, or, or or not? Well, another point along those lines too is um, I don't know how many, how much they were taken out with each withdrawal. Um, I can see several of them were like twenty four hundred, uh, so three withdrawals for a total amount of twenty four hundred. Uh, I mean, is this a case of the ATM should have some tighter controls on it? You know, if you're gonna pull more than three hundred dollars, let's say, you have to do it in person. Is that going to be too inconvenient for people? Uh, it seems like. There should have been some kind of detection system in place here, maybe, or maybe that's what needs to be developed that says, you know, this is really suspicious behavior. You know, all these withdrawals happening, or was it in just the noise, you know, of, of the day of the ATM that this really wasn't abnormal? You know, I haven't seen anything along those lines that shows like a spike in the chart or something. Was this abnormal behavior what they were doing, or is this pretty much fall in line with how other people use the ATM? Yeah, it's not clear from that. Um, and usually if there's a limit on the ATM on the cash withdrawal, but I don't know if that applies to specific bank accounts or in this case of having prepaid debit cards where there was no limit or at least that limit could be altered in some way. Um, so it's kind of unclear from, from the information here. Um, I thought it was interesting that they're talking about this being a, a, a fairly large theft, um, $2.8 million from just cash machines within New York City. And then they reference this um, $5 million Lufthansa heist in Kennedy Airport in 1978. Um, for those that may not have seen the movie Goodfellas, this was actually uh, – kind of reenacted in that movie, which Goodfellas is one of my favorite movies, so it's kind of funny to see that reference there. But they, you know, I think it's interesting that you have the the guys that um, compromise the computers in some way to make these changes and account to, uh, to get the access to the database, and then they somehow coordinated this physical effort to go out and capture this cash from all these ATM machines and to do 36,000 transactions within 10 hours. 
that's a significant amount of coordination to make that work. Uh, that part is the most interesting aspect of this, I think. Well, I, I posted another article, um, and it mentioned the uh, transaction uh, limits, and um, I think they were targeting specifically $800 transaction limit machines uh, in order to get the largest bang for their buck, essentially, the least number of transactions to get the most money. But um, apparently, this is, they did they did three they actually did this three times. They did. Um, they did one in December and uh, got four hundred thousand dollars in three hours, and then they did one in February and got two point four million dollars in uh, nine and a half hours, and then this one was over a much more significant period of time, um, and they got forty-five million dollars. So they this is something apparently they've been practicing doing. And uh, maybe the amount of money this time is what uh, got them uh, got them caught. It, it really got the attention of people because they just got so much money this time. Well, I don't know if that's the case, or it's just they finally had enough evidence from all these ATM photos of people, you know, withdrawing. Hey, why is this guy showing up here on this ATM and that ATM, and then over here? Probably put a couple things together asked around and got enough information to find the guys, at least in the U.S., and there's apparently arrests in other countries as well. So I don't know that it's the amount of money that caused people to become interested or the fact that they just needed more evidence, and these guys gave it to them by going out and doing it one more time. Uh, it, it's not clear from the information here. Well, this new article I posted... Um uh, has a kind of a, a, a rundown on exactly the process that happens, or that I guess they maybe surmise happens uh, when an ATM cyber robbery attack happens, and there's a step-by-step -step process on the on the way it works, and you know how information is 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 uh, d delivered and, and how the attack is coordinated, and it's interesting because. Um, they uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of thought and stuff that goes into this about because you know if you start making large withdrawals from ATMs there's going to be red flags and you have to you know coordinate how long you're going to be at a specific ATM and move on and keep moving you can't just stick around one and make you know hundreds of withdrawals you're gonna I'm guessing they may have had a stopwatch and. You know, we're like, okay, we've we've spent two minutes this ATM or five minutes, and we're moving on to the next one. And they just kept doing that over and over again to get to get the amount of money that they wanted to get, or to get a uh, stop when they wanted to stop, or whatever. Yeah, and and that's a good point too, though. You you know, I I think they're basically kind of working against you know. One person sees suspicious activity on one ATM, they kind of investigate that, but they don't think of reaching out and saying, you know what, let's notify our counterparts or let's shut down all our ATMs temporarily. Um, you know, they, they kind of work isolated, so these guys can just pop from one to the next, uh, do this little transaction, which uh, even though it's a lot of money, it's in a short period of time, probably doesn't raise too many eyebrows, and they just move on to the next one. You, you think somewhere along the line, or I guess we hope for somewhere along the line someone starts to see the big picture and says whoa 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 you know we need to just temporarily halt these things or you know we, we need to take some action here to, to slow this down but it doesn't seem like the big picture ever came into focus while the attack was active it was only in hindsight they're like oh yeah we got taken for a lot of money here well part of it is since they're using the prepaid debit cards my, my question would be who's monitoring those? Is it the company that issued the card or is it the ATM network itself or is it the bank that may conduct the transactions? Uh, somewhere along the line I don't think that happened and maybe this was not a threat that they considered. Maybe it was but they didn't have the right controls in place to prevent it or to stop it or slow it even. So you know there's not a lot of information yet here that says 
they were able to do this because the following controls didn't work or were bypassed. And I think that would be a much more interesting uh, bit of information to see. That way we can learn from this. I mean, you know, we always look in, in, in the information security world for examples in which something went wrong and, and we want to know how it went wrong, what people did to bypass certain controls and figure out, you know, is there an example in another area that we can learn from in this particular example? Yeah, well, you know, my takeaway would be, um, you know, the, the convenience of the ATMs also, the, the, the disadvantage. I think, you know, if I were going through the drive through and I'm like, I want $800 out of my account, they might ask me for a little more verification. But if I go to my ATM and I have my PIN and my, my you know, magnetic card, there's really no additional checks. Yeah, they might have a camera on. They might capture my picture after the fact, but well, true. But most ATMs on a regular account now, not a pre not prepaid debit card, but a regular account, there is a there is a daily transaction limit, and typically, I think it at one time it was two hundred dollars. You couldn't take out any more than two hundred dollars from any for a total. And it didn't matter how many ATMs you went to; two hundred was the limit for the day, and that was a way to slow fraud from occurring. So if somebody captured your card and knew your PIN, they'd try to hit every ATM they could. That was a way to, to manage it. You had this daily limit. Yeah, and, and to me, what we have here is just a loophole. You know, there's a way around that, and I think you could just close this loophole. I mean, if I get a debit card with a prepaid debit card with a high limit, um, would I necessarily want the convenience of being able to just pull all that out in cash, you know, or, or within a couple transactions? Probably, maybe not. I'd probably want that prepaid debit card so I could, you know, do some other purchases with it and wouldn't necessarily want to be able to just turn it into cash so easily. Well, I was unaware that you could take a prepaid debit card and turn it into cash. I thought it was only for purchases. Yeah. Well, I, I guess not. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, or... At least well, one thing we did learn that. <laughs> yeah, we did learn that. Well, I think the other thing about this is I think the banks and the uh, credit card companies are the ones liable for this $45 million. I don't think this comes off of consumers much at all. So is this a, is this a drop in the bucket for the banks, or is this something that they're actually going to say, well, maybe we should look at our security and do something about it? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, yeah, and I'd argue that it always comes back to the consumer. Um, we hope it's a drop in the bucket for them, but if they feel some pain, eventually the consumers will as well. They'll find a way to work it back to the consumers and transaction fees, or you know, maybe now they you know they lower the limit, or you can't as easily get cash out of your prepaid debit card now. But uh, I'm thinking if it hurts them enough, it's going to come back in some way to, to hurt the consumers as well. It usually does. Yeah. yeah, well, we'll move on to the next article, which is mine, and I just lost my window that had the article in it, so, uh, <laughs> so let me pull that back up. Uh, this one's about uh, Honey Words, uh, which is a, 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 our paper written by uh, Rob... Rivist, who is the R in the RSA, as well as the uh, Ari Jules, who uh, is the uh, chief security engineer, I think, at uh, RSA Labs. Um, and this is a, an interesting paper. It talks about, I mean, I'm, most of us in the security industry are aware of honey pots, basically a, a, a system that set up intentionally with, with vulnerabilities in it in order to catch hackers attempting to uh, break into your network. Essentially, you make, make a honeypot system, the low-hanging fruit in your organization, so you can see if your organization is being targeted. Well, the idea behind Honey Words is that when a user has an account on the system, instead of having a single password, they have multiple passwords that... Uh, for essentially accessing the system, and if a, a, a honey word is used, then an alarm will go off. So if, if for example, a, a hacker gets the password hash database of your website, 
um, they will not know if a hash password is a Honeyword password or if it's a, the actual password to get into the, the site. So they start cracking the passwords and, they, and, they, and there's a risk involved. If they use a Honeyword password, then they will set off an alarm. And if they, if, so they have, there is a, a significant risk to them of getting caught right away uh, if they use uh, these passwords. So that is the basic concept. I mean, the paper goes into more details about how to do these honey words, where to store them, um, and all that. But the, 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 the idea is interesting, and they're, they're not aware of any of this, of this concept being explored before, but they, they don't know. So I, I don't know either. Um, but, but it's an interesting concept. I mean, the, the idea is you mix good passwords and bad passwords as your honey words, so I think you can find the uh, essentially the level of cracking that they're doing as well. Well, it, it's that, but it's also to detect when when your password database may have been compromised and you didn't know it. Yeah. Because if, those, ha if those password hashes are out there, clearly you had a security control failure somewhere. Yeah, that's also true, and, and it would help detect that because, because it's nearly... Uh, if somebody is able to get your password hash database, is able to crack passwords, and is able to log in with those crack passwords, that at the moment is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to detect. And this is a method to actually be able to detect that by using uh, essentially, say, uh, you, with one user, you have one legitimate password and three Honeyword passwords. So if if there's a 75% chance that a crack password hash will actually not lead to a compromise, it will lead to you getting an alert that, hey, somebody attempted to use a password that was a Honeyword. It's an interesting idea. Um, they talk about a concept of a honey checker is basically kind of a, a system that uh, is a, acts as a secure server to watch for these honey words and you, there's a whole bunch of security implications for that as well. Uh, you know, you got to make sure that's working, otherwise you could have other issues as well. But uh, it's an interesting idea and um, it would be interesting to see if anybody's implemented this. I mean, the, the simpler solution might be, and I think it's discussed elsewhere, is creating you know fake accounts and you know that no there's not a legitimate user tied to a certain account but yet they have a pretty easy password to guess and anytime somebody tries to access that account with the password that you've hashed for them um, that would also be another way to detect that as well and I, I this is kind of a more complicated way of doing it I wonder if there's any significant issue with using the old fake password account, or I'm um, sorry, the face, fake account with an easy password approach. Obviously, that account doesn't get you anywhere, um, but it's kind of a simpler solution, perhaps. Well, I think the idea is to uh, essentially incre increase your odds, and and as I said, if you have one legitimate and three fake passwords per user, that's a 75% chance that. Uh, if they use a password, it, they'll, there's an alert. If you have a single or two accounts and, uh, you know, a, a, a 500 account or millions of accounts, you have one, two, wow. two fake accounts and five million accounts, you know, the odds of them using one of those two accounts, even if the password's simple, um, is not that likely. Depends on how easy it is. I mean, if you've hashed all your other passwords to be or if you have, make that one, that particular password easy to reverse engineer versus having a lot of your, if you use different password quality techniques to ensure that users choose good passwords, the easier to, easier to find one is most likely one they're going to use first. Yeah, that's true. True. If it's if it's a e if it, it happens to be the easiest first one that's going to come up on, oh, we're cracking this database. The, here's here's the first one, and it's your easiest password, and it's your honey word. Then yeah, that that might that they might use that one. But if you have a huge password database, pass users are probably going to be choosing bad passwords anyway, unless you have some sort of password policy. And yeah. that might be a red flag to them that, hey, this password doesn't fit the password policy. 
Yeah, well, I, 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 I knew what it was. To, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the paper itself. I looked at the article. Um, one thing I'm curious about, Preston, is you say kind of a kind of a three to one ratio, just as an example. You know, three uh, honey words for one real user password. Does the paper address the 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 very remote possibility that a user would somehow pick the same password as maybe one of the honey words assigned to their account? I mean, is that is that a possibility in the way it's done, or are the passwords structured so completely different, like they follow a different set of rules, or um, you know, is that a possibility? Does it talk about that at all as a potential of happening? Yeah, it does. It talks about a modified UI for password changes and basically having them propose a password and then appending something to the end of the password that they picked. It's actually, I, I think it's more for reducing the storage requirements of passwords versus actually um, versus having them choose the same password. Uh, but um, they're talking about if you use this method, you don't have to store uh, a bunch of unique hashes. You store a single hash, and then you can do things to it. I, I don't. I think there's some maybe a little bit of cryptography involved in it as well that I don't quite understand. But, <laughs> but maybe yeah. some mathematics that I'm like, eh, okay. But uh, the idea is that uh, yeah, there is some. I think it, it is discussed. And, and and how to how to avoid stuff like that. So so would there be some advantages even if you don't participate with this in your database to kind of just make you know make the statement yeah we use fake accounts and honey words in our database and if anyone uh, breaches us you know we're, we're going to know it. Do you think that would scare people off like the sticker on the door it says you have a security alarm and you really don't? You think that would work for anybody or you think that would just make you a bigger target? <laughs> I don't think it helps. It's security through obscurity. Uh, you know, even it, j just if you tell them that, I mean, really, how are you going to track them back uh, easily? You know, if they're in a different country, yeah, you know, pretty much forget about it. I mean, what's the what's the real value in 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 telling people you do when you don't? Yeah, I guess I was just thinking, you know, if you could somehow give the perception, hey, you know, or we, we do some things with our, our passwords, we'll know if someone's logging in, you know, we'll, we'll know if our system's breached, and we're not going to tell well, you all the details, but, but yeah, we, we'll, is, we'll know, so don't true, mess with us. True, but the problem with HoneyWords <laughs> is it's kind of like after the, the horse is already out of the barn, right? Your password hashes are already out there. Yeah. You've had a weakness in your security controls, and somebody has found a way in. That's a bigger problem, right? The yeah. fact that they co compromised your your password database. What else did they compromise? Would be my next question. Yeah. Well, no, I was thinking along the lines of if you're not using it, but you say you are, maybe someone's like, you know what? I dump. I was able to breach your system, but you know, I, I'm I'm fearful they're gonna know. I mean, do you think there's any kind of thought like that? They're like, no. I'm gonna go for it. You know, I'm gonna call their bluff. Well, what they would do would probably just. <laughs> Put it up on paste bin and say, "Here you go. Here's all the here's all the password hashes. You go do that. I already found a way in. I'm gonna go look for more ways to to mess with this company. <laughs> right? Yeah. Why yeah. why just why go after the passwords and the accounts if you've been able to compromise the 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 database of password hashes? What else could you find that might be more interesting and get you a little further access?" I I would concentrate your efforts there, especially if nobody noticed. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, the the the, pro the problem is, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to create a system around this, and you know, it's it's gonna you're gonna have to kind of uh, um, deal with that. I bot botnets and all that. I mean, you can they can. If they have a list of of, pa of cracked passwords, they can probably try, you know, hundreds or thousands or even millions at a time, and 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 find find some that work. So uh, I I don't know how you you may get alarms, but uh, if they if they know you do it, then they're gonna they're gonna use a method to kind of defeat your you to make it so well. You know, somebody's going to have to get an alert. Somebody's going to have to respond to the alert. Somebody's going to have to do something. 
unless there's some sort of immediate, um, okay, somebody used a, a, a honey word, now we disable all authentication on our system entirely and nobody can authenticate. And I don't think that's that's viable. Well, yeah, and that'd just be another attack vector for them. That that could end up being the attack they wanted to pull off. So, yeah, that's that's the tough part in security is the having the right resources and the right approach. And it's not always that easy. <laughs> like I said, you know, if a big company were to advertise they were doing this, they might just become a target for it because um, if they can get that honey word to trip and they have an automatic, you know, we're going to make all 50 million users change their passwords, well, that's bad publicity for them. Absolutely. There's always trade-offs to anything you do like this. So this is an interesting way of, of looking at the problem. Um, it would be not necessarily difficult to implement. It would be difficult to figure out when the right place, where the right place is to use it, I think. Or how to how to take that information and, and apply it in a way that you can protect your users and data. Right, and this is all kind of theory and research and all that. This isn't. I don't think this is. This is mainly for discussion and not really for implementation at the moment. I think that's why this paper was written. It's written in a in a, in a model of a research paper. So I don't think this is this this is quite ready for implementation at the moment um, but if somebody wanted to implement it and try it out then I think it would be it would be interesting yep definitely would okay well so with that we'll wrap up the show uh, thanks to Mike Hill Keith Watson and Josh Gillum who apparently did make it online and was able to listen um, I'm Preston Wiley